In a previous video, we had started to discuss the memory architectures of the 1990s era 3D GPUs. This video will pick up where the previous one left off, so you should watch that video first if you have not already seen it, as it covers background knowledge that's relevant to understanding the examples in this video. As a reminder, the previous part began motivating how the change in graphical performance was driven by increasing memory bandwidth. It also presented an idealized model of a graphics pipeline and applied it to the architecture of the PlayStation 1 and the Nintendo 64. This video will continue to go over specific GPU architecture examples, mainly the 3DFX GPUs. As a reminder, the specific architecture details presented are extrapolated speculation based on information available. Before continuing though, I would like to introduce another point of analysis between the architectures. Two primary measures of a GPU performance are the peak fill rate and peak texel rate. The peak fill rate is how many pixels can be filled per cycle. This is entirely dependent on the pipeline architecture and does not account for the video memory. Similarly, the peak texel rate is how many texels or texture samplings can be computed per cycle, again not accounting for memory. The reason for the difference is that a GPU with multiple texture mapping units per pipeline can have a higher texel rate than shading fill rate. Accounting for the memory performance with textures would be difficult without benchmarking due to performance masking caused by texture caches, essentially making the behavior texture size dependent. The same could be said for shading fill rate, but we already motivated in the previous video that frame buffer caches don't really work well for larger sizes, making the effect negligible. Effectively, as long as you're rendering something larger than a postage stamp, a memory bandwidth-based analysis should be valid. With that said, we can also consider the peak memory fill rate, which is how many pixels per cycle the peak memory bandwidth of the GPU can support. This would be the idealistic performance if somehow the frame stores were always filled through prefetching, and there was no bandwidth contention with the textures. So this is what those values would look like for the PS1 and N64, where both memory architectures could have in theory fully supported the fill rates. This was with the PS1 being able to support 2 pixels per cycle in 16-bit color, and the N64 with 2 pixels per cycle as well, including depth. We can also express these rates in terms of cycles, which will make the architectures easier to compare. As you can see here, both the PS1 and the N64's memory bandwidth were able to keep up with the fill rate of 2 pixels per cycle, being one read to blend and do depth compare, and the other to write back the new pixel. As a bit of foreshadowing, this wasn't always the case, which will come up again later in the video. With that said, what better place to continue than with the 3DFX Voodoo GPUs? The first versions to consider are the Voodoo 1 and Voodoo 2, released in 1996 and 1998, respectively. These two versions consisted of a split-chip architecture in which the texture mapping unit, or TMU, is separate from the shading and blending chip. As such, the video memory was dedicated to each chip, where the Voodoo 1 allocated 2 megabytes for the frame buffer and 2 megabytes for the textures. The Voodoo 2 then doubled the frame buffer memory and offered a version with double texture memory, as well as including a second TMU. The two TMUs of the Voodoo 2 allowed for trilinear filtering and other two-pass texture techniques to be applied in a single pass, thus increasing render performance. There were three main reasons cited for the split-chip approach. The first reason was that the chips became prohibitively expensive once the transistors crossed a certain amount. As such, it was cheaper to build two chips under this threshold than one bigger chip above it. The second reason was pin count, like with the N64, supporting the required memory bandwidth at the time would have required more pins on a single chip that would have been feasible, so breaking the bandwidth consumers in two made the problem viable. The third reason was scalability, where a single shader chip could support anywhere from one to three TMUs chained together. This allowed for the render complexity to easily scale with production cost without fabricating entirely different chips. The transistor count problem was solved moving into 1998, as well as the pin count problem with new chip packaging technologies. To keep the transistor count down on the original Voodoo, the choice was made to not include any 2D functionality and to use EDO DRAM. The lack of 2D functionality meant that the Voodoo GPU could only draw triangles and a separate 2D graphics card was required for anything else. The 2D output would then be sent to the Voodoo GPU via a pass-through cable to allow for a better user experience. By the time of the Voodoo 2, the internal implementations had greatly advanced along with an increased transistor count. As such, a 2D accelerator was included in the Voodoo 2's shader chip, but could not yet replace a standard 2D graphics card. This accelerator served as the basis for the 2D capabilities in subsequent generations. The GPUs that immediately followed the Voodoo 2 were the Banshee in 1998 and Voodoo 3, also known as Avenger, in 1999. 
These both featured a unified chip architecture, meaning that they consisted of a single chip that combined both the TMU and shading in a single package. As such, both the frame buffer and textures were stored in the same video memory. Like the original Voodoo 1, the Banshee used one TMU, requiring two passes for trilinear texturing. And similar to the Voodoo 2, the Avenger used two TMUs, which could likewise perform trilinear texturing or two-pass texture effects in a single pass. In addition to unifying the shading and texturing, the Banshee and Avenger included full 2D capabilities, meaning that a standalone 2D accelerator card was no longer needed. As a result, the memory technology moved from EDO DRAM to SDRAM, which was to handle the increased bandwidth requirement. The final 3D FX architecture released before they were bought out by NVIDIA was the VSA100, or Napalm, which was released in 2000, and drove the Voodoo 4 and 5 series. Continuing the trend with Banshee and Avenger, Napalm used a unified chip and memory architecture, included 2D support, and used SDRAM. Additionally, not only did Napalm include two TMUs, it also had the capability of shading two pixels per cycle using one TMU per pipeline. One special note about Napalm is that it was designed to be scalable up to 32 VSA100 chips, where the Voodoo 5, 5500 used two of them. Each VSA100 chip would have their own dedicated memory, which contained a mirrored copy of the textures, but a dedicated section of the frame buffer. This allowed for each VSA100 chip to render parts of the frame in parallel to speed up rendering. This video will only focus on the case of a single VSA100 chip though for simplicity. Before continuing, we should discuss the difference between EDO DRAM and SDRAM, since it turns out to be crucial for the performance of the Voodoo 1 and 2. There's a lot of numbers here, but they're just to back up what I'm about to say. The EDO DRAM used by the Voodoo 1 and 2 was known as Fast Page DRAM, which if you recall from the previous video, implies that it can access a full page or row in the DRAM very quickly, and it can. It does this by being asynchronous, meaning that it doesn't use a clock, but instead works more like memory in an older 8-bit system, leaving the sequencing up to the memory controller in the chipset. SDRAM on the other hand was synchronous to a clock, meaning that everything was cycle-based but had to be sequenced accordingly. It also was much slower to access. To offer a fair comparison, the EDO can be described in terms of the speed of the Voodoo 1 and 2 GPU cycles. When looking at it from that perspective, page reads from EDO can be done in less than a cycle, which effectively makes a read within a page as fast as reading from an SRAM cache. In fact, this is one of the key behaviors that allowed the Voodoo 1 and 2 to render as fast as they could. Aside from the fast page accesses, it also didn't take very long to switch pages, only 3 or 4 cycles. Given that a 64-bit bus page would be 4 kilobytes, that shouldn't happen very often if accesses have good locality, which I had motivated in the previous video. Though, one major difference between the two DRAMs is their capacities. EDO DRAM at the time could only go up to 4 megabytes for a 128-bit memory bus, while SDRAM could go up to 64 megabytes. 4 megabytes is quite small, especially when you want to render to higher resolutions, making EDO only practical in the early GPUs. Also, EDO DRAM was much more expensive than SDRAM, which is another consideration when trying to sell a product. So the summary here is that EDO allows for same cycle read accesses, and page breaks only take a few cycles. This means that the memory controller can be quite simple as long as it follows the asynchronous timings. SDRAM on the other hand must do burst reading to cover the read pipelining, and page breaks can be costly in terms of cycles. So to help cover that, the SDRAM also needs to use banking, which means the memory controller is substantially more complicated. But that's the price you need to pay for higher VRAM capacity. As the memory size increases, so does the access latency. To put this into perspective, the first two Voodoo GPUs didn't need a texture cache for their TMUs, because the page buffer effectively was the texture cache. This would have been 4 kilobytes per TMU. Funny enough, a page break or equivalent cache miss would have been much faster on the Voodoo 1 and 2 when compared to the PlayStation 1 and N64. In contrast, the unified chip GPUs that used SDRAM were required to have a texture cache to hide the access latency of the SDRAM. This means that the memory controller would have been much more complicated and would potentially have to reorder memory accesses to maximize row hits. In fact, the later Voodoo GPUs did exactly this. With that said, let's start by going over the Voodoo one. On the surface, this looks surprisingly similar to the N64's high-level GPU diagram, but there's a lot more to it. Firstly, there is a dedicated chip with its own DRAM for performing texture lookups, which 3 dfx called T-Rex. This chip had a dedicated texture memory which contained only textures, and a dedicated palette memory for indexed colors. The rest of the graphics pipeline was part of the frame buffer interface chip, 
which 3DFX called FBI. This chip contained the dispatcher, rasterizer, primary shader, and blending. Additionally, this chip had a dedicated frame buffer memory, which only contained the frame buffer and an associated frame store to accelerate blending and depth testing. The dispatch queue was also stored in this memory, but that took up a relatively small area and would only be latency critical when drawing a bunch of small triangles. This diagram doesn't really do the pipeline justice though, because the actual division was much less clean. To understand the division, we must first talk about the rasterizer. This stage had previously been shown as a single block, but it's actually composed of multiple substages. The primary function of the rasterizer is accomplished with the central block, which is responsible for determining coverage. If you recall from the previous video, this is the part that answers the question of if the pixel is within the triangle. Alongside the coverage tester are the iterators. These are responsible for computing the quantities that vary across the surface of the triangle. If you've ever written a pixel shader for a GPU before and used the term varying, these are what you are describing. In the older fixed function hardware like with the 3DFX GPUs, the number of varying quantities were limited. These included a blend color, which is used for garrode shading, a depth and inverse depth, Z and W, which are used for depth testing, and then texture-specific quantities like the coordinates S and T, and the inverse depth for performing perspective divide. Aside from the coverage test and iterators, there's also a block responsible for clipping against a clip region, a setup unit to initialize the coverage unit and iterators, and a triangle setup unit which is responsible for any intermediate computations. The reason why I am going into more detail is that the 3DFX GPUs partially split up the iterators. The frame buffer chip was responsible for doing the setup, coverage testing, clipping, and iterating the blend colors in depth, while the texture-specific iterators were distributed among the different TMUs. Each TMU had its own set of texture coordinates and perspective divide. It was necessary to allow for unique perspective divides in order to do environment map textures. This is how chrome effects were achieved. Additionally, splitting up these iterators further improved scalability, since they were added as needed with the rest of the TMU hardware. Next to discuss is the pixel format. While the Voodoo GPUs internally blended their colors using 8 bits per channel, and some calculations went up to 11 bits per channel, the frame buffer on all of the GPUs except Napalm was always 16 bits. This consisted of a 16-bit color and a 16-bit depth value. So when reading from the depth buffer, the color was expanded back up to 32 bits and contracted back down to 32 bits when writing. Similarly, the textures were all stored in either 16-bit or 8-bit modes and could be only color, color with transparency, indexed, or indexed with transparency. The only way to get 32-bit colors out of textures was to use the 16-bit alpha index format which could store 256 colors in an internal palette that contained 24-bit colors. There was also a mode that could use intensity instead of the index value, producing a grayscale image. But there was no 4-bit index texture mode. The end result is that frame buffer pixels are all aligned to 16-bit boundaries, or 32 bits when you consider depth, and textures can all be aligned to 16-bit boundaries as well. These can then be packed together into 64-bit buses, which is exactly what the Voodoo 1 and 2 GPUs did. Finally, these packings can then be mapped to individual DRAM chips. In the case of the frame buffer, this was done as two 32-bit banks, which could each have independent addresses. This allowed for non-interleaved color and depth to be stored, maximizing the frame buffer memory utilization. Similarly, the textures could have each texel mapped to individual DRAM chips, again having independent addresses. The pixels were then stored across banks in a Z-order fashion, which is how the TMUs could do four-point bilinear sampling at a rate of one per cycle. One caveat is that there is no free lunch here when it comes to row misses. If there is a row miss in one of the DRAM chips, then reads from all of the other DRAM chips would have to wait for the miss to be resolved. In the case of a texture crossing a page corner, this could result in four misses, one after the other. Taking that all into consideration, this is effectively what a more detailed view of the Voodoo 1 pipeline would look like. There are a few features to point out. The first is that all of the blocks have been divided into the frame buffer interface chip and the T-Rex chip. While the two units are integrated onto the same die with the later GPUs, they still retain a similar structure internally. Next, the DRAM chips have been broken down into their row buffer and the main memory, to stress how the page buffer was used in place of a single cycle SRAM cache. The frame buffer is shown as one bank to make the diagram simpler, and for the same reason, the other three banks in the texture memory are omitted. An extra blend stage is shown in the T-Rex chip, which was used for combining textures when multiple T-Rex chips were chained together. The input is indicated, and this is where the second TMU from the Voodoo 2 would be connected.
Like with the N64, there was a dedicated color palette table in the T-Rex chip which was used for 8-bit color data. Since the palette colors were 24-bit, this would be a total of 768 bytes. Furthermore, to facilitate bilinear texture blending, for simultaneous read ports were required, which appeared to be implemented by simply duplicating the palette table four times. As crazy as it seems, that means that there was 3 kilobytes of RAM just to store color tables for the 8-bit palette textures. The Voodoo GPUs also implemented a narrow color channel compression texture mode. This texture mode appears to have had its own multiport RAM, but that hasn't been included in the diagram since it's quite a bit more complicated. On the later GPUs, this texture mode appears to have dynamically swapped with the color palette entries when in use. This diagram still doesn't show the complete picture, since the architecture utilized FIFO queues between the various stages. The original Voodoo is much simpler in that regard, with the follow-up versions going completely crazy with FIFOs, where I counted 84 in the VSA 100. And lastly, a frame store for reading and writing is shown, which would be used for buffering transactions to allow for bus sharing with the dispatch queue and display output. The size of the frame stores is speculative from what I believe I was able to identify in a die photo. The actual buffers are much wider, but I speculate that was used for additional tag information, which looks to be consistent throughout the other Voodoo GPUs. With that said, unlike with the other GPUs, the Voodoo GPUs only had two modes of drawing, triangles or fast fill. The fast fill mode utilized the full bandwidth of the frame buffer bus, which could write back two pixels per cycle, consisting of color and depth. This mode would fill the entire clip region with a solid fill color, and therefore could be used to selectively draw large rectangles in the color buffer, depth buffer, or both. This was also used for clearing the screen at the start of a frame. In the triangle rendering mode, the entire pipeline would be used. This would be a case of drawing a triangle with a direct color texture, blending against the frame buffer, or doing depth testing. And here's an example using a palette texture with a second texture unit in a single pass. This mode would use both the texture combined block and the multiport color palette table. To summarize, the original Voodoo GPU was capable of doing a fast fill at 2 pixels per cycle, which included both color and depth buffers. The other rendering mode was triangles, which could only do 1 pixel per cycle. And if multipass rendering was done, it would require n over t passes to complete by re-rendering the same triangle, where n is the number of passes, and t is the number of texture units. This would result in a fill rate of t over n pixels per cycle, although rounding may be necessary to get a more accurate number. We can also include the peak memory fill rate, which was 2 pixels per cycle, for color and depth. This meant that the frame buffer memory bandwidth could keep up with the render pipeline in both the fast fill and normal rendering cases. And finally, we can compute the memory bandwidth for the DRAM and internal memories. The texture memory bandwidth is also included in the internal bandwidth case since there are no temporary buffers to replace them. Since the DRAM used was fast pay GDO DRAM, the comparison between the external and effective internal bandwidths is not quite as extreme as with the other GPUs. The increase in bandwidth is almost entirely caused by the wide 4-port color palette table. And when compared to the GPU and the N64, we can see that the bandwidth is comparable, especially considering that both GPUs were released in the same year. Obviously though, the Voodoo GPU was able to perform much closer to its peak performance than the N64, due to the fact that the N64 also had to share its memory bandwidth with the rest of the system. Regardless, if the overall internal memory bandwidths were matched, the Voodoo would do so with substantially larger and higher quality textures, and real 4-point bilinear sampling, unlike with the N64. Although, it's not really fair to compare the two GPUs in regard to quality, since they were designed for entirely different markets and at widely different price points. This comparison was just to compare the architecture and not the resultant graphics. The next question should be, how did the architecture change when moving to a unified VRAM? I had previously mentioned that the unified VRAM versions required the use of a texture cache, so an obvious question would be how big was the added cache? Well from die photos, it appears that both the Banshee and Avenger had a 1 kilobyte texture cache per TMU. Napalm on the other hand increased this cache size to 2 kilobytes per TMU. To put this into perspective, 2 kilobytes is the same size used by the PlayStation 1. Although, it's highly likely that the refill mechanism was substantially smarter in Napalm, preventing an accurate comparison with size from being made. There also appears to be an additional 1 kilobyte cache used by the TMUs in Napalm, which I would speculate may act like a victim cache to guard against page thrashing. This cache would not be read from directly by the TMUs, but could be used to quickly refill the 2 kilobyte texture cache without falling back to memory. This cache may have also been a mirror copy for read transactions across the two TMUs when operating in mirrored mode, 
to prevent reduplication. That's just a guess though, since I couldn't think of another reason why it would be there. If that is what the memory block was used for, then the total texture cache for Napalm would be 3 kilobytes per TMU. Note that this does not include the palette table and NCC compression table, which also appear to be separate. Anyway, given the similarities between the unified versions, let's skip directly to Napalm next. As a reminder, due to the complexity of Napalm and the lack of official microarchitectural details, this will be more speculative than for the Voodoo 1 and 2. Before doing so though, we should go over the list of new features added in Napalm that differ from the previous example. The first new addition of note is that Napalm implemented a second graphics pipeline, which could draw up to 2 pixels per cycle. This was accompanied with additional shading modes, which allowed for more complex rendering techniques. The most notable addition here was the ability for the iterated color to be passed directly into the texture combiner to control texture blending. Aside from the second pipeline, Napalm also brought the 3DFX GPUs into alignment with the competitors by having a 32-bit frame buffer option, which is in contrast to the 16-bit frame buffer from the previous GPUs. This meant that the color buffer could now be computed as 32-bit ARGB, and depth increased from 16-bit to 24-bit, with an additional 8-bit stencil buffer. This is the current standard frame buffer configuration for modern GPUs, with the exception of the more exotic render targets. And in addition to the 32-bit frame buffer, true 32-bit texture support was added, which is an improvement from the previous 16-bit textures. Compressed texture support was also added with the increased bit depth, which included a 3DFX proprietary format FXT1, as well as the S3TC formats DX1 through DX5. With that said, anyone who has ever worked with the DXT encodings can probably guess how wide the texture cache ports were. The victim cache port width was also sized accordingly. Other than the texture cache port width for the compressed texture formats, the most significant changes that relate to bandwidth were from the second pixel pipeline and the 32-bit frame buffer. One obvious question is, if there are two pipelines and two TMUs, how does that work? And more importantly, how were two TMUs used in the older versions as well? In the older Voodoo GPUs, multiple TMUs would be implemented as distinctly different chips, each with their own respective texture memories. As a result, multipass texturing would require that each texture memory contain their respective textures. For example, a brick wall texture with a light map would require that the brick texture be placed in the memory for TMU0 and the light map texture be placed in the texture memory for TMU1. This is how two concurrent textures could be blended together. Note that these texture memories are not restricted to a single texture though, the only restriction is that only one texture can be active for a given triangle. In practice, as many textures as would fit, would be loaded into the texture memory, since uploading a texture requires time and bandwidth, and therefore eats away at the available rendering performance. Replacing textures on the fly would still be feasible though, given that the maximum size supported was 256 by 256 pixels. A texture is set to active for a triangle by configuring the TMU settings, which includes the base texture pointer. If the settings are identical for multiple textures, then swapping a texture is as simple as updating the texture pointer for the given TMU. The GPUs with the unified texture and frame buffer memory operated similarly. However, they also had a linear frame buffer port, which could access the entire video memory as a flat address space. Textures could either be uploaded assuming that the texture memories were independent through their respective TMUs, or through the flat memory space. This is how backwards compatibility was maintained. In general, 3DFX suggested uploading through the TMUs, since that would keep the texture uploads in sync with the triangle drawing, preventing partial updates and graphical glitches. Similar to the Banshee and Avenger, Napalm could also operate in chain TMU mode, in which case only one pixel per cycle could be drawn. One mode unique to Napalm though, was drawing two pixels per cycle. In this case, the two TMUs would operate in a mirrored mode, requiring that they both have the same TMU settings and base pointer. On that note, Napalm did have the potential issue for cache inconsistencies, where switching between the chain TMU and mirrored TMUs would require a cache flush to the TMU's respective texture caches. The implication here being that it was more performant to leave the GPU in one of the two modes for the entire frame, rather than swap them per triangle. So do these TMU details really matter for memory performance? Well, yes, because in chain TMU mode, the two texture caches would have been distinct, effectively providing a total cache capacity of 6 kilobytes. This is as opposed to the mirrored TMU mode where the two caches would have been identical, effectively providing a total capacity of 3 kilobytes. This means that in the chain TMU mode, both TMUs and their caches would be fighting for memory bandwidth to keep the caches full.
whereas in the mirrored TMU mode, the two texture caches would both share the same memory accesses, since both caches would be identical. The result being that the chain TMU mode could effectively require twice the memory bandwidth of the mirrored TMUs. There is a small caveat, which is when the sampling positions may be misaligned between the two TMUs in mirrored mode. This could lead to one TMU requesting a new texture block before the other, resulting in two reads to the same video memory, one cycle after another. This is likely one of the main functions of the one kilobyte victim cache, to allow the second request to hit there, rather than reading from the same address twice in a row. With that said, this is what the high-level block diagram of Napalm looked like. One difference compared to the original Voodoo GPU is that the shade, TMU, and blend portion of the pipeline have been doubled. This was done to facilitate the 2 pixel per cycle fill rate, but there is still only one dispatch stage and one rasterizer. In 2 pixel per cycle rendering mode, both pixels were rendered side by side in lockstep, allowing for a shared rasterizer, which would have required a doubling of the pipeline iterators. This would have been necessary to maintain texture cache and frame store locality. As previously mentioned, Napalm used a unified video memory in which both textures and frame buffer were stored in the same address space. To improve bandwidth over the case of the original Voodoo though, the VRAM utilized a 64-bit dual-channel configuration, which could simultaneously access two memory banks, with a combined memory bus width of 128 bits. Like with the original Voodoo, each of the TMUs had a dedicated color palette memory for implementing the legacy index texture modes. And each TMU had a banked texture cache, which was capable of reading four samples per cycle. This allowed for single-cycle bilinear interpolation out of the texture cache. And tying the memory system together was a memory arbiter, which was shared with the frame store and texture cache. This arbiter was also shared with the 2D portion of the GPU, as well as the display list sequencer and the dispatch queue, but those won't be focused on here. With the big picture in mind, let's look at a more detailed version. The detailed diagram looks strikingly similar to the original Voodoo, with a few upgrades. The first is the newly added 2 kilobyte texture cache and 1 kilobyte victim cache, which replaced the 4 kilobyte page buffer of the EDO DRAM. As mentioned, this allowed for up to 4 samples per cycle to be read by the TMU by using a banked configuration. Next, there was an added feedback path between the pipeline and the texture combiner which allowed for the iterated color to be multiplied with the texture directly. This would have allowed for the iterated color to be used as a blend factor between two textures. For example, blending between grass and rock for terrain, or between night and day textures of a planet. The link to the second TMU was also retained, which was used in the chain TMU mode to facilitate single-cycle multipass rendering. And finally, the frame store was increased in size. This was done to support the increased access latency of the SD RAM compared to the EDO DRAM. From what I have been able to determine, the frame store appears to be mostly the same size as with the Avenger, except for an added 4 bytes per row to the read store. The increase was likely to support the 32 bit frame buffer, although it should have been doubled to a total of 16 bytes. I haven't been able to come up with a good reason behind this smaller increase, but my best guess is that it was done to save area given the video memory bandwidth. The end result would be that one of the channels, either depth or color, would have to be doubled up, resulting in a fill rate slowdown. In contrast, the right store would be able to handle the 32-bit frame buffer, though this is a remnant from Avenger to support the 2D Accelerator's 128-bit render path. Similar to the original Voodoo, two pixel per cycle fast fill was supported, or a constant color and depth were written to the frame buffer. This worked in both 16-bit and 32-bit frame buffer modes. Again, the standard 2 pixel per cycle rendering mode would look like this, which is almost identical to the original Voodoo. And similarly, the 1 pixel per cycle rendering mode with index textures would look like this. We can then perform the same fill rate analysis as with the Voodoo 1. In 16-bit frame buffer mode, the fast fill and normal mirrored rendering can do 2 pixels per cycle. The chain TMU render mode can only do 1 pixel per cycle, since both TMUs are used by the same render path and the peak memory fill rate is 4 pixels per cycle including color and depth. As a reminder, each pipeline would require a memory fill rate of 2 pixels per cycle, so 2 combined would require 4 pixels per cycle. Thus, the peak fill rate would not have been video memory bandwidth limited in 16-bit frame buffer mode. We can then perform the same analysis for 32-bit frame buffer mode, which looks identical, except for one major difference. The peak memory fill rate for a 32-bit frame buffer is now only 2 pixels per cycle, since both the color and depth sizes were doubled. But we already established that 4 pixels per cycle would be necessary for 2 pixel per cycle rendering. This means that in 32-bit frame buffer mode, 2 pixels per cycle would not have been a viable configuration, instead being massively hindered by the VRAM bandwidth.
This may be one of the motivations for the frame store not increasing by a factor of two, since it wouldn't have mattered. And in fact, 3DFX had a note about the performance of two pixel per cycle rendering in 32 bit mode, where they stated it may perform worse than one pixel per cycle. I would speculate that this is why the Voodoo 5 cards contained at least two VSA100 chips, otherwise their GPU would have fallen behind their competitors in 32-bit rendering. As we can see, one pixel per cycle rendering would still be fine in 32-bit mode, since two pixels per cycle is all that's required to maintain the fill rate. The resultant conclusion is that when rendering with a 32-bit frame buffer, the best configuration would have been to use the chain TMU mode, which could do single-pass trilinear filtering, or two-texture blending. Note that this memory bandwidth limitation will not have a direct impact on the chain TMUs unless the texture caches start fighting the frame buffer for memory bandwidth. In other words, if the textures used fit within the texture caches in single pixel mode, then the peak texel rate of 2 per cycle would be unaffected. And we can also look at the memory bandwidth, where the SD RAM was capable of two simultaneous reads or writes, for a total bandwidth of 2.65 GB per second. The internal memory bandwidth, on the other hand, was capable of 29.8 GB per second, which is 11.2 times greater than the DRAM bandwidth, and spread over an additional 19 simultaneous memory ports. When you compare that to the original Voodoo GPU, you can see the drastic increase in bandwidth. Furthermore, this is only one VSA100 chip, where the Voodoo 5, 5500 would have doubled all of those bandwidths and port counts. And if there was any doubt, the clock speed increase between the generations was roughly a factor of 3. If you also include the second pipeline, you can say that's roughly a factor of 6, which is still less than the total internal bandwidth increase, again showing that the bandwidth increase is what drove the graphical improvements. I should note that I am leaving out a discussion of some of the more advanced features, such as pixel reissue, anti-aliasing, and SLI, since that would have been quite a bit more complicated to go over. Those added features further increase the internal memory bandwidth, but would not be a fair comparison with the other GPUs due to them effectively being a post-processing step. And like with the previous part, this video is on the longer side, so I will have to leave the PlayStation 2 and the Dreamcast for part 3. Also, as a reminder, this video contained a fair bit of speculation. If you notice something incorrect, please feel free to let me know in the comments. Anyway, hopefully you found this interesting. Until next time, thanks for watching.